Good morning. My name is Efren Braun, and along with Manuel and Maria, I'll be presenting uh, our report, Model-Based Control with Stochastic Simulation. So essentially what this is, is we're manufacturing thin films. So why is the manufacture of thin films important? Well, there are lots of applications. The first and perhaps most important application is solar panels. So why do we need thin films for good solar panels? Well, first of all, uh, if we use thin films, then you use less silicon. Polycrystalline silicon, which is the material of choice for solar panels currently, is pretty expensive. And the less you use of it, the, uh, the less expensive your solar panels will cost. And this will allow us to achieve greater grid parity with uh, contemporary fossil fuels. Furthermore, if you use these thin films, you get just a, light, a more lightweight product. And you can also get something like a flexible product. And you can imagine that this le will lead to somewhat unconventional methods of energy storage. So you can imagine someone hiking in the woods and they run out of juice for their, um, for their flashlight. And they just pull out a thin film photovoltaic cell from their pocket and they use it to charge it up. And you couldn't really do this with a battery because it's too heavy, but with this thin film photovoltaic, really lightweight, really easy, and it's very portable. Another uh, application that we didn't concentrate so much on, but that's important too, is an anti-reflective coating. And this is used often with, uh, with optics. So there are two pictures on the screen ab above you with the glasses. The one on top does not have an anti-reflective coating, and the one on the bottom does. And you can see that the glasses on the top, that you can see what's behind the camera. You can kind of see the outline of a head. And you can imagine if your glasses you know, have these uh, outlines and everything on them, you can't see as well. So these optical uh, coatings just really do a lot to help you see better. And you can also put these on things like cameras to reduce glare, which just leads to better photography. And a third application that we'll talk about, though there are many more, are catalysts. So typically, the way that you make catalysts is you have a support, like silica, alumina, some oxide usually, and you deposit um, some kind of catalyst on it, whether it's a base metal, a precious metal, a zeolite, anything. And what you really want for this catalyst is you want it to have a large surface area. So you can see that that catalyst is very porous. And the reason for this is because the catalyst only works at its surface. That's where the reaction takes place. And particularly if you're using a precious metal catalyst like platinum, you want to get as much bang for your buck as possible. So for all these different applications, you want different morphologies for each one. And that's really the challenge that we're trying to address. So there are a few different ways to make these thin films. The way that we focused on, the, the method that we focused on is a physical vapor deposition reactor, shown here. Um, and this one uses a technique called sputtering, which is when you shoot high energy uh, particles onto the, onto the particles you want to deposit. It excites them and then it deposits them onto the substrate. But there are many other types of reactors available. There are PVD uh, condensation reactors and there are also things like chemical vapor deposition reactors. But there are just a lot of different ways to do this. To motivate the need for control, we're going to show two images here. And these images are both taken with a scanning electron microscope. And you can see that the one that had control is a better film. So the top image shows the surface, and you can see that the one that was controlled has much less cracks. It's just more smooth. It's better. It's less rough. And this might be important for something like a photovoltaic cell. You don't want there to be cracks in there, because let's say you have it on your roof and it starts to rain. You don't want water to get stuck in there and clog up your solar cell. You want it to be able to glide down. And from the cross section, you can see that the controlled one has better, has lower porosity. Um, this could be good or it could be bad, depending on what your application is. Like we said, for catalysts, you want high porosity. So now that we've kind of introduced why we need to have control, what did our controller actually accomplish? Well, there are two main things. First, our controller was capable of finding optimal operating conditions. So you can see here that the, um, that the film that we grew under control ends up in a just a much smoother surface and a better film. The second thing that, that our uh, controller does is it can compensate for initial disturbances. So let's say you're a company and you receive a substrate from your supplier and it's very rough and it doesn't look very good, but you, you paid for it, it's within the specs, and you want to use it. What we can do is, and you can see that there are two films right there, both of them are initially uh, roughness disturbed, and you can see that after running it through the controller, we were able to eliminate much of that roughness. Whereas for the one that wasn't run through the controller, the initial roughness that was in there, the peaks and valleys, just propagated throughout the film. 
So now that we've shown what the controller can do, I'm going to pass it over to Maria, who's going to talk a little bit more about the technology behind these. Thank you, Efrem. Um, so I'm going to go a little more into the technical details of our control algorithm. Um, a suitable um, approach for controlling thin film deposition process is model predictive control. Uh, it has been shown to uh, provide better results for stochastic processes than other conventional types of controls, such as PAD controllers, for example. And um, uh, the model predictive approach uses a simulation software um, to model the process, and it's the process model block um, on the diagram below me, or behind me. And um, so, um, sorry. This, um, the simulation software um, basically models the physical process. It uh, mimics the um, evolution of the film. And uh, it sort of acts like a computational microscope because it provides information on the film microstructure that would be difficult to obtain through real-time measurements. Um, this information um, is used by the controller to select appropriate uh, input parameters. And the controller provides these input parameters back to the process model and also to the real process, which runs in parallel. Um, a neat thing about this framework is that it's very modular. So, um, for example, if the simulation software used uh, does not model the process very accurately and um, better uh, softwares become available, uh, they can easily be uh, replaced without need for much modification to the actual control algorithm. Um, so, uh, focusing more on the simulation software that we used, um, it's, uh, it's called SPARKS. Uh, it stands for Stochastic Parallel Particle Kinetic Simulator. Uh, it's an open source code. It was developed at Sandia National Laboratories, and um, it is uh, designed to be easily extendable for use with, others, uh, with other code, uh, such as, and, uh, as we used it as part of a control framework. Um, it can model several different kinds of processes. Uh, thin film deposition is one of them. It um, also models uh, polycrystalline grain growth, and uh, there's an image on the slide behind me of uh, abnormal grain growth. And um, Sparks uses a kinetic Monte Carlo um, algorithm to, um, to simulate these processes. Um, so I'm going to explain the kinetic Monte Carlo algorithm briefly. Um, the uh, algorithm takes input variables, uh, which it uses to define rates for all possible events. Um, it then selects an event based on these rates. Uh, it executes the event and updates the simulation time, um, which, uh, again, the, the time it takes for, uh, for an event to be executed is proportional to its rate. Uh, it also updates um, the um, system information, and it loops through this process until the simulation time runs over. Uh, for our purposes, the events that we were interested in modeling were diffusion and deposition, and uh, the, rate for, the rate of deposition is just a user-defined constant, and the rate of diffusion is a function of the system temperature and also the system configuration, which is captured in the uh, delta energy term in that equation, and it takes into account the uh, bonds that are formed and broken during a diffusion process. Um, so how is this useful for control? Um, Sparks, as well as any other... Um, a simulation software, by the nature of the KMC algorithm, keeps track of where all the particles are. And um, therefore, it, it um, can tell you what the film looks like at any point in time. Um, so this information is provided to the controller, uh, which uses it, um, which uses it to, uh, well, the controller runs another simulation to predict um, at the current input parameters to predict what the film will look like. And uh, it compares the film properties um, at these input parameters to a reference point, which was obtained through an optimization process uh, previously. Um, if the difference between these two films is within an acceptable error range, then the controller just keeps the current input parameters. Otherwise, it goes through the optimization loop uh, highlighted in red. Um, and uh, what this does is it tests several different input parameters, and it selects the uh, combination that, provides, that, that minimizes the error. So once the controller selects uh, the input parameters, it then feeds them back to the process model and to the actual real process. And uh, this uh, continues uh, as, as the uh, deposition process goes on. So uh, if you've managed to stay awake through all the block flow diagrams, I'm going to pass it over to Manal now to um, talk about what, we're, uh, what our controller controls for and how well it's doing this. So good morning, everyone. Uh, now that we have this uh, model predictive control framework in place, uh, we can uh, focus on the type of uh, microstructure that we want. And as Ephraim uh, discussed earlier, there are a variety of uh, requirements that we can impose uh, on the microstructure. Uh, for our purposes, we uh, decided to focus on photovoltaic uh, applications. Uh, this uh, requires that our film uh, be smooth and have very little internal defects. 
the schematic up top uh, uh, illustrates uh, our quantification of these properties. The, the surface roughness uh, is a measure of the fluctuation uh, in height of the thin film. And the, the red uh, vacant sites uh, give a measure of porosity. Now these properties uh, show a very strong dependence on temperature. As discussed before, uh, the, this is due to the fact that there are various events that our film can uh, experience. Uh, we can have a deposition event of new particles, or we can have a diffusion event of the particles that are within the film. Uh, the diffusion events will uh, fill in pores and uh, weather away any roughness as temperature increases. And as you can imagine, the opposite is true uh, for uh, lower temperatures. Uh, we get uh, more porosity and uh, more roughness. So we spoke about two different uh, uh, needs of, that our controller uh, had to address. One was to develop uh, an optimal uh, process, uh, set of process parameters throughout the growth. And this is done by changing the temperature, which uh, uh, controls the microstructure. As you can see, uh, the green uh, profile gives us uh, the, lowest, uh, the lowest porosity and roughness measurements, which is what we are interested in for this photovoltaic device. Now, the control and, and uncontrolled uh, simulations uh, begin at the roughness disturbance that we uh, showed at the beginning of the presentation. And as you can see, uh, what, what we are interested in is that the controller uh, deviate the uh, roughness microstructure uh, away from the uncontrolled uh, profile and onto the optimal profile uh, of the process. And this can be then shown uh, through the film images that result from, from this process. As you can see, uh, the control process yields uh, a, less rough, uh, a less rough film, uh, while the uncontrolled process has more peaks and valleys, which indicates uh, higher roughness. Uh, so with this in mind, um, we'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, all our uh, professors that were in instrumental in